Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining myself, Chris P, and Robin Russell on our coach development webinar. Robin, welcome. Uh, give us a little bit about you, Robin, and we'll get straight into it. Uh, yes, thanks very much, Chris. Um, yes, I worked for the English FA for uh, quite a long time, about 26 years um, uh, in education, coach education, and, and grassroots development. Um, I then left to become a, a, a consultant with UEFA, which I still am uh, the last 15 years um, in grassroots uh, and the last four or five years with the Asian Confederation. Um, and I'm also doing some work for US Youth Soccer on a program called GRIP, which is about uh, growth and retention. So basically, um, the purpose of today's seminar uh, webinar um, is to look at uh, retention and the role of the coach in retaining players because worldwide the issue is not necessarily attracting kids uh, to soccer it's retaining them once they've been attracted brilliant um yeah so robin what i'm going to do is i'm going to turn over control panels to you uh, and I'm going to make you the presenter so you can go through your PowerPoint. And uh, I know we're going to we're going to try and keep this tight, but we'll put in the in the show notes everything you've done. You are a Rush board member as well. And if I'm not mistaken, you were involved in the in the writing of the FA Charter standards and then uh, the grassroots program and then also um, implementing the small sided game in England and traveling around the country and and uh, doing that um, but today's purpose we'll get into the grip stuff which is the growth retention Im Im impact uh, program is that right yeah that's the acronym for it and then uh, we'll, we'll get going and then we'll get questions from the audience and we'll also get uh, we'll, we'll have some questions around that and uh, by the end of this webinar we will have sent out a, a, a survey right um, we'll, we'll then, be sending out the survey uh, subsequently yeah yeah so anyway without further ado Robin let me make you the panel presenter and then you'll be able to share your screen and go through that PowerPoint okay okay thank you very much. okay so you should be able to see Robin um, the two little screens on the panel um, a little two computer screens where you can share your your screen and then we'll get through with your PowerPoint. People, if you're on and can hear us, just type in the chat. Yeah, brilliant, Robin, we can see your GoToWebinar connected to GoToWebinar. Um, um, all right, one second. Yeah, bear with us, everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you see that, Chris? Yep, coaching for retention. Okay, thanks very much, Chris. Uh, just to move this along then, um, what we're gonna do is look at these particular aspects. Why is it important? Which groups are at most risk? What are the problems? How can the coach help? Uh, and that's what we're gonna walk, walk through. Um, retention's a, an aspect throughout all of world soccer in the developing countries or the developed countries uh, and it's worth uh, repeating what Einstein said that if we keep doing the same thing and same thing again then uh, we're really not going to uh, affect it and insanity is actually doing the same thing over and over again expecting different results we're talking about overall playing participation not the potentially talented we're not talking about academies um, we're not talking about um, developing players for college soccer or for the professional game we're talking about retaining as many players as possible uh, but we are saying that the retention in soccer is not at the expense of other sports um, indeed you'll see some examples of multi-sport um, and it's not retention in order to specialize in soccer so why is retention important if we agree that sport and, and soccer has some health social educational benefits then these are only going to be achievable if players continue to play uh, 
the financial stability and the sustainability of the club is dependent on retaining players. Um, Rush clubs know this as, as well as anybody else. And the next generation of volunteers and coaches and referees are going to come from those players who have had a, um, a spell, a decent spell, playing soccer. It also relates to the financial stability and sustainability of the sport. Uh, this is an issue, as I said, all over. There's some figures as far as we've done in UEFA on six countries that basically those that currently play uh, and those that um, compared to those that used to play or indeed never played, um, participants are key to sales of match tickets, whether you subscribe to a soccer TV uh, channel and whether you purchase football merchandise. So it's really important to the sport that we retain the players. Which groups are at most risk? Well, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the relative age effect. If you're not, Google it. Um, but basically late birthdays, quarter four birthdays. Uh, if your registration period begins in January, we're talking about birth dates in uh, October and November, December, they are 15 to 20% more likely to quit uh, than, than quarter one birthdays. That's a Dutch FA research. Does this happen at your club? Uh, do the kids who quit, are they more likely to be the quarter four birthdays? Do you have the data for your club that you can check this? That would be the, 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 the group that's uh, most at risk is late birthdays. So looking at, uh, this is a, a, um, a typical state association in the USA. You'll notice the, uh, the, the, the curve of participation starts low, peaks and then drops off. The competitive and the uh, recreational aspects um, and the recreational percentage. That's, you would say, well, typical. What, what's new about that? Well, if we dive down a little bit lower and look at the growth, now we can do this uh, as we've been doing by tracking the individual players. So that growth uh, starts off very high and then uh, drops off. The, the the, the second group I would say to look out for is the teenagers. Uh, basically, uh, soccer has stopped growing players uh, after mm, nine years of age. So we all assume that marketing for soccer is at the younger ages. What about those teenagers uh, on those from 10 year old onwards, 10, 11, 12, 13? Why not market to those teenagers who used to play or maybe never played? Why stop marketing uh, and promoting to teenagers, um, particularly if they just like to play recreational soccer? So the, and the next bit is turnover. Now, what does this diagram show? It, it shows that turnover is um, really the opposite of retention, but it's highest at the earlier stages. So whilst here it's going up, the overall participation is going up, that's masked at the young ages because growth is still high. So the analogy is this, uh, we're, we're filling the bath uh, at the younger ages and the bath water's rising and we think that's great. Actually, we've still got the We've taken the plug out and <laughs> the water is coming out of the bath. The, the, the level of water is only increasing is because we're still growing. So if we could reduce the turnover at the early ages, we'd increase the number of players. If we could grow the players in teenage years, we'd increase the number of players. So um, which groups are at most risks? I would say all five to ten year olds keeping them in. Those teenagers who want to play soccer but don't want the regular practices and over competitive games, um, they may come back 
and we do them if you want to check that website it's a massive website in europe for uh, recreational soccer i just want to go back to this particular aspect here in that the turnover rates once they get to under nine under ten are quite steady so the evidence is that there is a group of players here that like competitive soccer and stick with it but that's uh, so that our idea that oh well it all drops off at 13 14 isn't borne out by these stats um, and these stats are repeated in a number of states so the point with being this is that the turnover is greatest at the earliest years and can we uh, include some growth in the later years by marketing to uh, either non-players 12 13 14 year olds who haven't played soccer or in fact maybe um they've played uh, earlier and, and dropped out so um those are the three groups i would say that are at most risk check it out in your own clubs look at the data in your own clubs there's um there's that? actually sorry robin there's uh can you hear me okay there's yeah. actually some, some data shown i think it's uh 75 percent of teenagers are dropping out um in this country right i don't know whether it's in every country and then 84 percent, and i could be off on the percentage but 84 percent of kids under six have played the sport but then those drop out those numbers become uh, significantly high um and i think some of the work that we've done and what we've seen is the parents we haven't done a very good job in engaging and educating the parents on this is what soccer might look like for your five or six year old it's normal if they don't want to play and they want to pick flowers or make airplanes um, but then the parents what they do is they see that and they go ah oh, soccer's just not for my child because they didn't participate and they didn't like it so then it's sometimes the parent that's pulling the child out because they they don't think that the child has grasped the sport is that would you say that's in line with some of the research or the findings that you have going on first of all um i think you have to make any assumptions based on data and the, the figure thrown out at 75 percent drop out that's the total numbers the total numbers um are dropping off but we don't um, underneath those total numbers we don't yet know um, until this particular study how is that related to growth or retention as i've showed you can still be increasing the total numbers of playing the sport whilst retention is dropping so it's possible and it is the case in the younger ages that retention um, uh, people the, the dropout rate is at its highest of five six seven eight but that's mass because they're still coming into the sport that doesn't really show until later in the year uh, later in 12 13 14 when you say ah look at the numbers uh, the, the, it, it's the retention the retention has been low since the beginning the retention gets better from the figures we've shown in the in the teenage years because those that have opted for competitive uh, soccer are staying there so i would say this in your own club do the data track the individual players before making any assumptions and i would question the they often say that 75 percent drop out as teenagers so that, 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 that we don't know underneath that that the the growth and retention aspects yeah yeah Okay, so what are the underlying problems? Here's, here's some of the the, the, um, the issues that are thrown up. Is it cost? Uh, I, I spoke at the, the German grassroots conference last year and there was a presentation about the average cost of registration for under 18 player in Germany. It's four euros a month, about a dollar a week, if you like. Um, these are similar costs in the UK and France and Holland. So uh, the, again, the, often quoted ah it's the cost in the usa um which which leads to high levels of uh, turnover it it the, the high cost of playing may be a factor in actually attracting them to the game but there is levels of retention and uh, levels of turnover uh, it, it is a problem in uk in the france and holland in western europe uh, in asia 
uh, retention is a problem elsewhere where there are far, far cheaper uh, registration programs. So they still have a problem with um, retention. Uh, is it competition from other sports? In Europe, that's ice hockey. There's about a million, uh, that's ice hockey in the Czech Republic. Probably, uh, I show that because it's, uh, I'm going to come back to the Czech Republic. That's probably the highest uh, in, in the uh, in in Europe, 120,000. That's what it is in Germany. Uh, I mean, there's about um, 2 million soccer players in Germany, about 21,000. Uh, so it's about 1%, if you like, in ice hockey. So it's no great retention. They're not leaving soccer uh, to play other sports in retention in, in Europe. Um, what about the USA? Um, well, I'm fascinated with the uh, increase in flag football. Um, the New York Times in an article says there's, uh, the, the increase has been 38%. So what are the, the key aspects of flag, flag football? It's playful, it's informal, it's recreational, in many cases it's uh, co-educational and there's an optional commitment. Um, I don't have to go to practice, I, I don't have to, I can miss one week and come back another. It is very informal and it's playful competition. Um, it's competition from e-games. Um, FIFA, EA Sports FIFA is the most popular computer game in the world ever. And there's a record of some of their sales, phenomenal sales. And it's soccer, thank goodness. Um, there's a number of copies that have been sold in uh, 2015. Um, it, it, it's outselling uh, everything else. Uh, people say there's no value in e-games. And I, I use that quote there from two parents who uh, who realize that e-games uh, video games if you like uh, fascinate them they're inspired by them um, and that they notice that the kids developments in, in leadership and friendship and uh, and strategy is is um, and social aspects is is really quite phenomenal so what are the common features of e-game playful competition we come back to it's social it's self-organized no coaches or coaching it's problem solving and there is an optional commitment i might play tonight i might not play tonight and there's a high level of imagination so we're going to keep coming back to these key fe features so key features of flag football playful competition social um key fe features of e-games playful competition social self-organized um is there enough free play well the belgian fa um have started two versus two and three versus three for five to seven year olds. They've noted a 25% increase over three years. Um, the recommended coaching points they, uh, they recommend for uh, um, five to seven year olds is none. No coaching. Facilitate, sort out the uh, field, make sure that they understand the rules, but no coaching. Uh, and if you want uh, evidence of that, have a look at that particular YouTube. Um, example there no coaching uh, it's playful competition and woof, they've had an increase of 25% um, in those ages over the, uh, the last three years there's an example of the sort of thing many of us used to play uh, just very 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 simple uh, two versus two free play uh, there's a site, if you have a look at it, Joy of the People, uh, an interesting site. They believe in free. It's absolutely free. Uh, it's free play, no set teams, no leagues, turn up and play. It's mixed age, mixed abilities, music. And if you want to have more information, have a look at that particular aspect there. Um, Ted, Ted Croatan. Ted Croatan? Is that Ted Croatan? Yeah. That is, that is yeah. Ted, yes. Yeah, he's been um, a guest with us as well. Have a look at uh, this particular club in uh, England. They are, um, they've been voted the FA Charter Standard Club of the Year. They have waited this. They can't get, they, they don't, their, their problem is capacity. And their simple free pledge is that, first of all, the children's views must be sought. And at least 50% of the games are free play. Uh, and the adults should facilitate the game to meet the needs of the kids. So it's self-organized, uh, it's 
uh, their views being sought, it's free play. So that we can sit there. if you're saying what works, okay, we've got e-games, we've got flag football, we've got um, uh, we've got what what they're doing in Belgium, what they're doing with uh, Joy of the People, and what they're doing with uh, Salisbury Rovers. Um, use of imagination. Uh, the UEFA have just taken on board a, a program run initially by the uh, the FA, the English FA, using Disney characters for helping the imagination of those five to six and seven year olds. It is play, it is very playful, uh, and it uses, uh, if you like, storytelling. Uh, that is it. So if you want some uh, links to that, uh, look at those particular articles there or that particular uh, YouTube aspect there. Uh, quality provision, is it just all kickabout? Well, the evidence in, in England shows that um, this is FA uh, Charter Standard Clubs, which we started about 18 years ago now. So that 80%, 78% of all youth football is now... Uh, in uh, charter standard clubs, which means that um, those clubs have to reach certain higher standards in terms of uh, they all need to be, um, uh, they all need to have child protection clearance, they all need to have, uh, have had some uh, education, uh, there is some stability in the club, etc. 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 So, the evidence that the FA would show is that uh, retention is 15% higher in those 80%. Uh, of, uh, of clubs than it is in the 20% that aren't part of the accredited provision. And uh, an interesting, an unbelievable project in the Czech Republic because they were concerned about maintaining these kids uh, and the links are at the bottom there, you can check it, um, that they've had a 92% retention rate uh, since 2014, 2015 uh, with the very high quality a program that they have for those particularly young ages and it is it's free lots of free play but if you look at those youtube videos there you will see it is also multi-sports it's physical education using the medium uh, of football so uh again it's multi-sport it's play it's imagination uh, but it's 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 done with a in, a in a high quality situation when i say that the adults involved have had been through uh, they've, they've been safeguarded, if you like. They've been uh, uh, checked out. So, is it coach quality retention? Um, the Germans, I say, have, have a problem, as we do have with with the retention. Um, but in, in Germany, their research was show there's only forty percent of the grassroots coaches with any training. And in Holland, the average is for a grassroots coach is four years lifespan. So, uh, it's it's. Uh, a, a, a very short lifespan if you like they're only going to get four years out of volunteer these are all volunteers of course um but uh, the levels of of, of um, training and the length of time that the grassroots coach is going to be in is quite short it's very short so uh, and that was some research that i did about um, four years ago with technical directors uh, what about the needs of grassroots coaches? They found course attendance for these people was, was difficult, but they wanted more information about how to coach, not what to coach. So not yet another passing drill, not yet another dribbling move, not yet another drill. They wanted to, that's the what to coach. They wanted more information about how to coach, making it fun, understanding children uh, and understanding age of progress. So I do, I do uh, wonder sometimes when I hear of clubs. Well, we've got a great curriculum, uh, you know, for our under nines or under tens or under eights, and it, it's it's about um, uh, uh, our our influence in the club. We have we want all the club, we want all the teams to play the same way in our club. And I'm thinking these are eight and nine year olds. It's about play, and the evidence is it's about play. It's about being self-organized. It's about helping them use their imagination. Uh, it's not about us imposing curriculum, if you like, on the kids. So how can the coach help? Um, is the club performance focused 
or is it participant focused? In other words, are you judging your and performance may not necessarily mean results, because as we know, uh, results aren't everything. But are you judging the coaches on how many players they're retaining? Or are you judging the coaches on the performance of the players? Now you might say, well, if the players um, are taught to perform better, they will they'll keep playing the game. Well, we go back to Einstein then. Uh, we've always thought that. We've thought the best way to keep players playing the game is try to improve them and I'm sure coaches do try to improve them but that's performance focused are we really participant focused yes there is a group that want to be performance focused but are we providing that too early far too early and um, is there another group uh, that as they grow older want to be more participant focused in your club are you performance focused or are you participant focused what sort of learning environment does the coach facilitate need a coach or the facilitate need to create? Now the evidence is they've got to be safe accredited coaches and uh, facilitators. It has to be in a safe environment. Okay. But then playful competition. It's child-led, it's self-organized, it's problem solving, it's optional commitment, it's co-education, it's social, and it exploits their um, imagination. Is technical knowledge the most important aspect for the young, for the coach of young players? No. I would suggest that the evidence is increasingly showing that the programs who are doing most at the younger ages are those where technical knowledge is actually, if you look at Belgium, not important. They do not want anyone coaching the kids uh, at those younger ages. If you, if you actually introduce selection, uh, if you have tryouts, if you start to select the kids, then almost immediately you open the door to a relative age effect. And therefore your team will be biased. If you don't believe me, have a look at your own club. Um, what sort of game environment does the coach need to create? Well, again, this is obviously a, a part of the club policy. Relative age effect, uh, is there agreed minimum time? Uh, is the play, is it playful competition? How are you organizing to make sure it's playful competition? Uh, are there teams and leagues and league tables? For example, in England, uh, there are no league tables uh, for mini soccer until uh, 11 years of age. So there's mini soccer and teams play each other and it's competitive, but they don't publish results and they don't have league tables until 11 because league tables is an adult concept it's not uh, it's not a kid's concept um let's have a look at different strategies for different ages uh worth having uh, uh following uh, this young lady on twitter amy price um she's looking at how uh, basically uh, video games and the format of video games can help in retaining the interest uh, of kids uh, in soccer. So if you want to look at those particular um, examples, uh, the how, how you can use the format of video games to help kids uh, retain their love and their imagination and their um, desire to keep playing. Uh, there's some references that uh, uh, Amy's already created. Uh, she's a, a lecturer um, in, in, a, in coaching development uh, here in, in London, uh, but she's already done quite a bit of research about learning to play soccer using a, a video game design uh, and unlocking the potential of a games generation. Have a look at at those things here. Amy's four C's at the bottom are cheat, challenge, change, and clue, which any of you who've been playing video games or e-games will understand those particular aspects. As an example, here's a video game design and the instructions on the right there are for the kids. They are uh, instructions for the kids, uh, if you like, and then off they go. When I say instructions, that's the, the, the context, the prompt and off they go uh, and there will be certain aspects within that. 
to give you an idea, uh, 25 years ago, we had a, in England, we had the football curriculum guide uh, for schools, uh, which we developed. And as part of this at the back, we had challenge cards where teams were given a card um, with a certain scenario. There's a scenario, your team is 3-0 ahead in a knockout competition, um, but you've got one player less. Outline how your team will play. Ask the kids to discuss that. Here's one at the bottom. Uh, your team was one player less than the opposition. How will your teams attack in defensive tactics? The score is 1-1. One, one. Um, is this going to be sophisticated tactics or not? No, but it's an opportunity for the, to, to, to give some ownership to the kids. And you can have a, 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 a you can devise these yourself quite easily. So key um, questions to ask the coach. Do we assume that if we coach players to improve, this will automatically retain them? Hmm. You ask your coaches that. How much of the practice session is organized and led by you? And how much is it led by the players? So I'm a great believer in coaches planning sessions. But how much is it planned by you and how much is it, how much uh, self-organization um, uh, do they have? And you're going to say, well, hmm, uh, can you do that at younger ages? Of course you can. That's what kids do when they play. They organize themselves. How much of the session is free play? Um, Salisbury Rovers say, well, at least 50%. How many times do you intervene? And what percentage of the session is you talking, listening or watching? That's very interesting. If, it's, if it should be more about listening and watching, how are you preparing your coaches to listen and watch? We all prepare coaches to talk, but how are you preparing them to listen and watch? Uh, and have you used video or e-game format to provoke and inspire your players? How often? What results have you had? So. What works in your club? Do you actually track retention and growth? Which programs and coaches are most effective in retaining players? Do you use entry and exit surveys? Do you use end of season surveys? Do you ask the players at the end of each session? And do you have a club retention plan? Regarding the the top aspect there, what works in your club? This is a concept we've uh, come up with the soccer garden, if you like. Uh, you can use it uh, to look at the teams in your club. And basically, uh, top right hand corner are the ones that have got high player retention and high growth. Um, the, it's not meant to be judgmental in any way, but uh, how would you classify your particular teams in your club using that format? Is that format at all helpful at all um, in terms of um, who, how would you classify the various uh, coaches or the teams in your club? So if you have a club retention plan, what are the key elements? What does it look like? Are the parents and coaches are fairly aware of this? Does it work? Does actually your retention plan work? Uh, if it does, where are the bright spots? At what ages? And what gender? Who's doing it well? And as an example there from that particular club in England, seven very simple uh, aspects. Talk less, say more. Less options, less numbers, less progressions, less progressions, less telling, more independent thinking, less showing, more problem solving, less talking, more listening. So anyway, um, we have a, 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 we'll inform you about a, a rush survey on retention, which we're very interested if you could uh, take. Uh, the respondents will receive uh, the survey results and in, in, uh, ov obviously overall uh, format, um, uh, completely anonymized, uh, and we will provide access to a coaching for retention blog. Um, we'd be interested if you could contribute to that blog. If you're interested in the data and analysts and surveys that I've mentioned, then uh, it's Adam Conant, Satari, Satari Soccer is, is the guy who's um, 
heading up that uh, that's the person I work with. As again, if we keep thinking, right, it's two practices a week and a game on a Saturday and 30 games a year. Uh, if we keep doing the same thing over and over again, it is insanity to think we're going to get different results. So we, we, we must look at how we are um, being, if you like, um, instead of being performance, based we are participant based okay uh there's my email uh and my website and the um email of adam cool okay chris for the time being that's me over to you yeah brilliant so uh i'm gonna just present make myself a presenter again if that's okay robin are you still there yeah yeah, yeah i see you yeah. Um, so brilliant. We've got some questions. We've got some people on if they think of questions. I I've just been busily scribbling notes here. Um, and it's funny because you, you mentioned uh, Salisbury Rovers, which I think is Debbie Sayers, right? Um, right? And I've been following Debbie's work and we've had some conversations. But then you mentioned Amy Price, who's coming on. We have Amy Price coming on in May as our webinar to go over video game design and stuff uh, we've talked about. Um, this is a statement more than a question is uh, this is Tim Schultz. Thank you for presenting excellent stuff. Thank you so much, Robin, from Tim. Um, I know Pablo is on as well. Um, so hopefully they'll, they'll come some questions. So um, a couple of key things, right, you, you pulled upon. Uh, the fact that in England, the, the retention rate was 15% higher with the Charter Standard clubs. Uh, yeah, right, that was one of the stats, quality control, yeah. yeah. Um, and then what, what I'm taking away from this, Robin, is obviously you talked about the Belgian FA, ages five to seven, they don't really want you coaching, they want you facilitating. Um, yes. So it's not always stepping in. The, the, the key words that kept coming in was playful, playful competition, um, free play, which, you know, our buddy at... Uh, Joy of the people, Ted Croatan does very, very well. Um, but the, the Federation has made a movement here in the US, and I'm sure you're aware of this, but the met methodology at the grassroots level now is the play, practice, play. Right? So there's a big movement now to use this methodology of play, practice, play, where the first play phase is just uh, the coaches observing the children playing. And then they bring them in for their, their pre practice part, which might be uh, themed on dribbling, where they have more challenging, less challenging, but they're giving children also an opportunity to have a choice in whether they want to do the more challenging or the less challenging. But what I'm not seeing there as of yet is having the children be involved in that learning process um, and stuff like that. And then the second part of the, the play. Um, Pablo's just echoing, he's typed in, it wasn't a question, he's just echoing Tim's sentiment of this is excellent. So I'll keep going with some of the questions and I'm sure Drew, Andrew Crawford will come up with a with a question or statement. Um, can, I just, can I just say yeah. that, Chris, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not suggesting that uh, uh, play practice play uh, is, is not a, a, a viable option. All I'm saying is if, if, if that, what, what you want to do in a club, um, then um, can you track it and monitor it to see if in fact it works? If it does, oh, that's that's. Uh, but we 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 would be saying play play practice play because we think that's uh, the best um, format for kids. And, and and I would I would suggest we think it's the best format. But we don't have any evidence to do that. Now in your own clubs, you can have pilot groups. You can look at um uh various groups to say okay what really works now i know you're going to have an inspirational coach and we've all had inspirational coaches um uh, and they have been enormous but inspirational coaches are, are few and far between what sort of format uh is is most um uh, appreciated we know uh that um that Kids in mainstream education at very young ages now have been given an awful lot of responsibility um, 
to organize themselves in learning situations, that they're, they're encouraged to take on board um, decision making that in our generation <laughs> it was unheard of. Are we doing that in football? Now, I'm not I'm suggesting it. Monitor it, track it, see how yeah. well it works or not. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think you've, you've given us some key things, though. Right. And I, I don't remember uh, where this information came from, um, from one of your slides, but it was fun, understand children and understand, understand age appropriateness. And then by the side of that, people want to know how to coach, not what to coach, for example, just to relate. Um, so basically, uh, with the work that they're doing in iCoachKids.eu is know who's in front of you, right? Know who's in front of you and can it be relative? And I think it might have been uh, Horst Vane that, that said uh, a children's sporting experience should be uh, unique. It should be like their shoes. It should fit them and it should be comfortable. And I could be wrong on that, that quote on who said it. Um, but I think, Robin, obviously you've given us loads of ideas and I think it would be a very interesting um, project for all Rush clubs to do. Obviously, uh, you know, I'm sure clubs have a retention plan, but I'm not sure how many actually share that retention plan and how do we do it. Um, and I think there's times where we don't do exit interviews and we don't do entry interviews and we can we just consider, oh, you know, the numbers are up, but we don't look at what the turnover is. You know, so this is obviously, you know, Tim has a goal for Rush Soccer to get to 100,000 players by, you know, 2040, for example. Um, you know, but if we retain them and we keep them in sports, and, and I, I believe it's China, Robin, and you may know better, but I think they have like a, a walk-in league for like people over 70. It's walking football, but they still get together, they play, you know, just keeping people involved in the sport for as long as possible yeah uh, it, it, it it is um uh, i mean it, it's easier it should be easier to um keep existing customers than it it, it is to get new customers uh, and so uh, most associations and clubs around the world do very do a very good job at, at um, attracting uh, kids to football. Given the enormous enormous um, exposure of, of soccer in on TV uh, and in FIFA e games, um, the retention rate should be through the roof. I mean, in Europe and in Asia. You know, uh, the, the the exposure to soccer is phenomenal. Um, it should be through the roof. And, and increasingly in North America, you've got access to TV that 20 years ago you wouldn't have had. So uh, it, it, it can't be the fact that, oh, well, you know, it, it, I get uh, here where it's a different culture. You know, our kids can't watch TV. You can watch, you can watch more TV in, in the USA, top class soccer, uh, both MLS and European and South American and probably anywhere else in the world. So um, it, 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 if, if what we were doing previously was so good, our retention rates would have been through the roof. Now they're not. Um, and uh, we therefore have to look, well, what else can we try? Now, I don't know whether free play is going to uh, automatically increase the numbers retaining. Uh, there is some evidence to show that this is the case. And there is some evidence that, as Amy Price would show, there's some evidence that um, involving their imagination will uh, retain their interest. But you need the data. You need to track it in your own club, to track the data in your own club, to see how well you're doing it and who's doing well and who's not doing well. And how can we help the ones who are not doing well? Absolutely. Um, as a, you mentioned the flag football, I know that um, US ice hockey, their retention rates have been higher um, with some of the stuff that you're doing. Have you ever looked into some of the stuff that USA ice hockey's done, Robin? Is there any um, other sports that are leading? I, I, I haven't seen their figures. 
the, what, what most the best you get from most sports is their overall registration numbers now what we've been able to do for us youth soccer in this project with adam kuhn at uh, satori soccer is dig below the overall retention uh, the overall participation numbers and look at how much of that potential how much of that uh, participation is growth and how much it is retention as i say uh, I, i've looked at the uh, the ice hockey figures on their website um, and they would appear to have gone up and down and, and going up again but that's their overall numbers i'm not sure uh, it doesn't give any indication about their retention uh, figures because to, to get the retention figures you've got to track the individual players so for example what Adam Kuhn does it at, at Satori Soccer, him and another guy called Adam Lefebvre, they uh, take the uh, data from state associations um, in Excel files. Uh, and the only, they have, the only data they have is the date of birth, the gender of the kid and the club. Um, and therefore, um, you know, they don't put emails or anything like that. Um, and a player ID number, player ID number, date of birth, uh club and gender and they then track the individual player through uh, season after season and that's the only way you can you you need to track the individual player and you will track players leaving one club and going to another all right well at least the state the, the growth is within the state uh and um they're still in the sport there's new players that come in that haven't been in the sport that this is the first time that they're in so it shows uh the the uh, the the overall growth per club the growth per sport uh and and the, and the turnover and you have to track the individual to be able to do that that's just the start we've got a question that, that yeah. gives you the we've got that a question that's coming robin okay um, it's from Andrew Crawford from Gateway. He says, do you think some retention in clubs comes from wins and losses uh, from games through a season? Um, I, I, Again, it needs to be tracked, Robbie. Right? I would say, uh, without repeating myself, what does the data yeah. say? Not what I think. What does the data? In your club, if you... If, very successful clubs you'd say well we retain players yes i'm sure competitive clubs uh, would, would retain uh, they, you know, we, it shows that competitive clubs uh comp it, it, the retention rate in teenagers in soccer in america once they enter competitive soccer is quite good uh the, the, the issue i would say is it's only it's quite good for those born um <laughs> in quarter one yeah. quarter two quarter three uh and secondly, you've missed out on those ones that started at five, six, and seven. And also, there's, there's a group there who, who don't want to play competitive soccer, but would like to play recreational football um, when they're 14, 15, 16. Yeah. So uh, I, I understand your question, Andrew. It, I would say, I don't know. Um, find the data. Uh, and, let, and let's see, is there a relationship between uh, winning and retention uh i don't know but what i do know is that there's only a very few number of clubs and teams are going to be able to win every year but let's have a look um have a look at, at, at that at, at, at that particular issue um but i would have thought that the the main aim of the club is to try and get as many players and keep them for as long as possible uh yeah what how that is done you'd get the answers by tracking the data yeah i think i think sometimes we we get, we get it backwards right we we're on this quest to start travel programs early um as opposed to keeping as many players playing in the best possible environment for as long as possible you know um so i i, I don't think there's any further questions robin unless they start coming in but did you have any um ending statements was there any questions or statements that uh i missed and didn't ask you 
Well, no, um, when, when this um, recording gets distributed, there will be a link to a survey for Rush coaches. It would be really grateful if you could complete the survey uh, and um, involve in this particular debate. Uh, and this survey, this particular survey is exclusive just to Rush coaches. Fantastic. And then uh, once they complete the survey, Robin, um, they do get a small prize for completing the survey. Is that correct? Uh, Yes, there's, 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 they, get, they get a discount on a course if they like that. They don't have to have it. There's a discount on a course, a very large discount on a course. Um, but um, the, 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 they also get uh, access to the blog that we should create on, on coaching retention, uh, coaching for retention, um, which hopefully then can spark off some discussions in their own club. Yeah, well, in their own club and across the, the Rush Nation, as it were, and uh, and oh. stuff like that because you know Tim has this goal of a hundred thousand players but you know if the if the if there's not growth and there's not retention we're not going to hit that hundred thousand uh well that's, it'd be a lot harder to do it yeah absolutely absolutely so hey, can Robin, just, can, I just, can I just say that often and people say ah oh, uh, if the national team does well it'll have an enormous effect. Uh, now, there are instances of national teams do well. The, the, um, the national team of Greece won the uh, Euros in 2004. Uh, and it affected, yeah? yeah. Uh, and it, it, it hardly registered in terms of participation. It, it, it created lots of interest in, in Greece for a, a number of months afterwards, but it didn't affect participation um mainly because they weren't geared up uh, at, th at that point in terms of clubs and teams and coaches uh the first time uh when um, france had the world cup in 98 uh they won the world cup they had a terrific interest in 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 football but they hadn't yet geared up um, in terms of clubs and teams and coaches now when they had the euros the last euros in 2016 they were set up um sadly they didn't win it but the fact that they hosted it and it was a, a you know an excellent tournament they had the backup so uh, the idea that um large events automatically increase participation isn't borne out with the facts uh, the london olympics was supposed to have created a million more participants. It didn't, because um, the, the, <laughs> there wasn't enough um, time and money spent on infrastructure uh, for, for the grassroots performer, the grassroots participant. So um, it isn't just about, well, if the national team do well. If, the, if you have a, a great structure, if you have a good structure of clubs and coaches and teams, um, then yes, if you have, uh, if you host and, and you uh, uh, and you do well in a, in a competition, that can have an effect. But doing well by itself won't have much effect. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, Robin, you've been fantastic. All right, thanks very much. Thanks it's for the good. opportunity, and look forward to reading the responses in the uh, in, in the survey. Yeah, and we'll get that out if you want to send that to me and uh, we'll get that going. So okay. I hope you're well. You look well. Okay. Brilliant Thanks as always. We'll talk soon. Thanks. Thanks. See you, Robin. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.